Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining our tax masterclass. This morning, we'll be discussing the life cycle of an M&A transaction. Um, and this is part one of our masterclass series, where we will speak from the genesis of the transaction up until structuring and funding. And in part two, we'll be covering the implementation of the transaction and pitfalls to watch out for. Um, I'm Devaling Sekavate, a partner in the ENS Johannesburg office. And my co-presenter today will be Christelle van Rensburg. And I know on the invited said, our other co-presenter would be Mangaliso Nzimande. That is not Mangaliso in disguise. That is our colleague Gustav Vandenberg, who has graciously agreed to co-present with us this morning. Um, Mangaliso couldn't be here, unfortunately, because life literally happened and he had um, the birth of his daughter yesterday. And so he's off with his family today. Um, so I think... We'll start with a, just a general overview of the M&A life cycle um, and right at the genesis, sorry, I'm trying to share my screen here. While I'm trying to sort that out, the genesis will generally be that the parties will agree on the term share, right? So the, the terms of the agreement will be set out in the term share and the, the term sheet, and the parties will agree whether the transaction will be structured as an asset sale or a share sale. Generally, the parties will either agree that, um, you know, the, the buyer will buy all of the assets or the buyer will buy the shares um, of the business in which the assets and liabilities are housed. Um, now, generally, the purchaser will uh, prefer to buy the assets, um, and that's because they won't then inherit the historical tax position of the seller. And all they have to worry about from a tax perspective anyway is allocating their purchase price to the, the various asset classes. Whereas the seller will then have to suffer either CGT on capital assets or recoupments on allowance assets and income tax on trading stock. Now, there's also other considerations to be kept in mind, depending on the type of assets that you are disposing of. So say, for instance, we're disposing of a mining operation with capital assets and mining property, then we'll have to keep Section 37 in mind. We will have to go and get our effective valuation from the DMRE, and then they will tell you how to allocate your purchase price. Or if, for instance, your seller is a non-resident, then Section 35 Cap A will apply where the purchaser will then have to withhold the CGT and pay it over to SARS. So those little nuances might creep in in the case of an asset sale. Where we have a share sale, however, then it becomes a bit more complicated. So the seller will obviously, in most cases, prefer to sell the shares because they just want to sell their whole hog and don't want to stay with issues that might be there in, in the company, whereas the buyer might not want to inherit those issues. And this is where we have the due diligence process, which becomes very important for flagging the various risks and this might actually have an impact on the terms that are agreed upon in the term sheet. So Gustav will take us through the important considerations to be kept in mind when we are doing the due diligence process. Thanks, Ntebeling. And as ntebeling has been saying, that when it comes to inheriting tax risks, specifically in the context then of a share sale, and you'll see there on the screen when it comes to due diligence, that there are different types or I would say categories of due diligences, which is really dependent on the extent to which you delve into the underlying issues. And the ones that we specifically work on regularly, um, I've, I've categorized them according to four different categories. So the first one is a high level red flag due diligence. And that's especially in the context of looking at material tax risks that would result in more risk than reward for the acquirer. So, for example, inheriting uh, significant tax liabilities from either substantive or compliance perspective or a risk of adverse audits by revenue authorities, so SARS. Then there's a more detailed due diligence. We will do a much more detailed deep dive and we would look at for example, all the different 
line items, we'd really go into a lot more detail. Um, red flag is, is different in the sense that we, as I mentioned, we look at the significant liabilities and that's where uh, we also can have a hybrid approach. So if there are specific liabilities and risk areas that we've identified, then the client might specifically ask us to delve into those areas a bit more, or we would recommend to really go into those areas in a bit more detail. The, the other one, which is the fourth category that we, we, we can do and that we've done um, also on multiple occasions is more of a focused due diligence. So for example, if you have a client that are basically uh, the buyer is quite uh, satisfied with the, the, the tax position of the entity, except in the context of all the different litigation and SARS audits and verifications that it's currently undergoing, then you would do perhaps a litigation, uh, a tax litigation due diligence to advise them on the potential risks on current litigation or disputes. That, that's just one of the examples that uh, you can go into. So if you look at the, the next category there uh, around categorizing any risks or any areas that you've identified in a due diligence and recommendations that we would make uh, to the buyer in the context of those risks, that could range over, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the graphic from the one end to the other end, the higher end being a reduction in the purchase price, possibly negotiated between the parties, and then also considering if more to the middle um, of that spectrum, maybe some representations or warranties being made and also looking at what the indemnities would be that the seller uh, or the target would provide. And then potentially um, much more um, closer to the lower end is potentially asking the target or the seller to rectify maybe instances of non-compliance they don't create that big a risk that you won't recommend a reduction in purchase price or anything else, but that could really be rectified prior to acquisition um, at the, obviously at the target or the seller's uh, own costs. Now, another thing that is very important that we recommend is due diligences. What follows a due diligence is usually the structuring of the transaction itself. And it's very important then that when looking at both the due diligence and the structuring, it's advisable that those two go hand in hand. For example, uh, you know, just to give you an example, there might be historical issues that could result in the actual structuring being necessary to have cons consideration to those historical issues, such as previous group relief used and also in the context of funding mechanisms and any historical issues and understanding of how previous transactions worked in the context of the targets and the target group to determine how you would do that structuring. And it really makes it much easier if you have the same due diligence team doing the structuring and the due diligence. And we really see that as going hand in hand. So most due diligences, we would then follow up with the advice on the structuring also. I just want to get back, so I've, I've jumped uh, one step ahead, but just getting back to the mitigation of risks, and one of the areas that we'd like to just uh, talk about today and, and spend some time on, uh, because it is a developing area and the market is seeing a big uptick in this, and it's in relation to uh, tax insurance and tax uh, indemnity insurance. And I'd like to take you through a real life example of where we've been involved in one of these insurance policies. But before we get there, I just wanna go into the different types of uh, tax indemnity insurance that one uh, would see in the market. And the different ones is basically, we categorize it into two different categories, either tax insurance uh, or warranty and indemnity insurance. Now. These are slightly different because tax insurance would basically relate to significant known tax risks. Um, for example, also advanced uh, tax payments like evaluation risk, uh, transfer pricing risk, and the availability of uh, big tax assets in the organization. 
Whereas warranty and indemnity insurance, those would be lesser unknown tax risks that won't, weren't necessarily identified in the due diligence process. Um, and it can also be maybe known risks, but much smaller. Um, so specifically what we've seen um, in warranty indemnity insurance in terms of the market, uh, there are some standard exclusions, such as transfer pricing, uh, which is one of them, valuations, uh, maybe secondary tax liabilities, and then the possibility of, after the buyer acquires the target, losing a specific tax asset that it might have inherited, or as the case may be, then not inherited because of a assessed tax loss or uh, capital expenditure that it could uh, be able to, or thought it could be able to deduct in future. Um, so just delving into that in a bit more detail, then some of the examples that we've seen and that we've worked with on recently that are insurable and have been insured then in the past were the application of group rules to previous transactions or prospective transactions uh, withholding taxes on interest, dividends, or royalties. There's also tax treaty issues. And also one of the interesting ones to me that we've seen the insurers do is they actually also insure uh, tax avoidance. So if there's a risk arising from a potential tax uh, avoidance arrangement, they, we've actually seen the insurers also uh, put out insurance for um, anti-avoidance. Uh, so those are the type of examples that we've been working with recently. And what I'd like to do is, as I mentioned, go into an example where we've dealt with a difference of opinion between the seller group, so the target, and the what we actually found in the due diligence as regards the tax treatment of a specific flow of income to management which in the context of what the seller or the target argued would have been subject to dividend withholding tax. So let's say then the 20% dividend withholding tax, whereas when we looked at it, we our concern and our analysis really indicated to us that it's, it's not a dividend withholding tax liability. And the view that we took is it was actually subject to income tax in those individuals' hands. And then the com committent issue with that was that because they were employees of the organization, actually subject to pay as you earn. So let's say then applying a straight 45% to that, the difference between the 20% and the 45% in taxes. And it was very interesting because there were very various different iterations of that risk calculation. So we were involved in the risk calculation and coming up with the numbers getting all the numbers together, because I'll explain now why it was really, in, why, how we were also involved in brokering the different insurance premiums, is we had to look at a lot of different scenarios and potential likelihood of those scenarios arising in very different, uh, different contexts. So the example that I want to use, one of the examples is that the question was, do you insure the full 45%? Um, because that's potentially something that you would be able to insure. That might, might be your first hit that you would incur to SARS on the 45%, not necessarily being um, in the position to deduct the 20% dividend withholding tax. So the question was, would you insure the full 45%? or just the margin, the difference between 45% and the 20%. Um, also considering penalties and interest and for which period you were looking at those penalties and interest. And it's, when we went into the market and got the different quotes, we looked at a host of different periods. So for 10 year period, seven year period, a five year period, but also one of the specific things around the five year period was obviously statute of limitations, is there the possibility of uh, SARS picking that up, but also underlying, just taking into account section 99 of the Tax Administration Act, which limits the statute of the, or the prescription period when it comes to misrepresentation, um, fraud or non-disclosure. So those were 
very much the type of discussions that we were involved in uh, with the different underwriters and insurance companies. Then on top of that, the tax avoidance, which I've also mentioned as one of the examples. And another interesting point is, do you treat the payers you earn liability based on the uh, company being liable for that and grossing up the payers you earn liability or the potential of the revenue authority actually going after the actual employees. And there were other related issues there to the extent that let's say the insurers required the employees to sign indemnity forms where they would indemnify the company uh, against any liability. So whole host of things that we took into account. And that was very important because the buyer wanted us to consider this and mitigate it as much as possible. And they asked for our advice how to mitigate it. And we did recommend to them the tax insurance. So we went out into the market and we approached various insurance companies and underwriters and explained to them the different categories of risk and the different scenarios. And at that point in time, also based on the different insurance companies, but also the different underlying scenarios, got pricing in the market as to what the pre potential premium would be and conveyed this to the client and also looked at, you know, from their end, deciding on what an appropriate policy would be, what that would cover, the extent of the cover, and also what is possible in um, a cost outlay for, for premium purposes. So it's a really, really involved process. And we were brokering um, the pricing with the different insurance companies and ultimately then became involved with the uh, brokers and the underwriters. And we also drafted a significant portion of the um, tax insurance deeds and indemnity deeds and all those things. So there were a lot of things that we were involved on there and that we've seen in the market um, and that we realized that the growth in the appetites of insurers actually um, insure tax risks and what's what's also involved in the extent of the appetite that they would that they would have and to what extent they would for example ask for an advanced tax ruling by the revenue authorities to try and mitigate um, the the extent of the risk tax opinions um, to their comfort uh, and also what uh, the difference of opinion is in the target um, seller uh, or the buyer in the specific instance. Crystal, is there anything else that you've seen or would like to add examples where you've also seen um, recently seen tax insurance in the market? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Gustav. Um, so I think I think what's quite important from a tax pers insurance perspective as well is um, to to understand you've you've mentioned the top of risks. Um, I think tax insurers have come a long way. Um, I mean, I think the first time I uh, dealt with a tax insurance matter about fifteen years ago, it was very expensive. So that has recently changed, and I think it's because there's more players in the market. So there's more competition and so the rates are more competitive. It really depends also on jurisdiction. So um, some of the insurance are uh, much more comfortable on the South African market and therefore, um, and they know the South African Revenue Service, um, et cetera. So they, 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 the, the fees um, or the pricing will be uh, accordingly adjusted. Um, as opposed to some of the African, rest of Africa jurisdictions, um, it might be more costly because of the type of jurisdiction. Then um, the tax insurance, for instance, in um, UK and Europe is also um, quite inexpensive these days. So that's some developments recently. Um, also, I mean, I, re I remember when when this was the first time I dealt with it, as I mentioned, more than 15 years ago, um, there was a, about one or two players in the market. Um, I, I see, I see a question um, from, from our attendees. Uh, can we discuss, uh, there's such a big list at the moment. Um, we normally work with some of the big brokers, Marsh, some of the big insurance companies, AIG, ISIN. Um, so we've got a whole list. I'm happy to have a separate discussion on that. Um, but, and I think that's the positive of tax insurance. There's um, much more players in the market. Um, 
there's brokers that that do does this and and what we normally do is our involvement is to what the tax insurance companies first want to know is what's the tax issue we're de dealing with. As you mentioned, Gustav, the question is whether we're dealing with um, uh, general warranty and indemnity insurance, which is a general tax risk, or is there a specific tax issue that you need to insure? Um, then if there's a specific tax insurance, then we normally put it back together. Um, we give an opinion of what the issue is. Um, we do, we assist with quantification in most of the uh, times, the insurance company would actually also get a third party advisor to look at the opinion, look at the quantification um, so that they can clarify that. But what we also recently learned, some of these insurance companies have tax expertise within them and doing these things themselves these days. So, which, which I think also helps a lot, um, and then um, once once that process is it depends, then you go out to market and you would say, well, what is the fees and the cost um, and the offer on the table? Um, also, I mean, costs, um, we generally look at about 2.8% to 3% for, for specific tax risk issues. Employee tax, interesting you mentioned that example of employee tax. That's quite a costly um, tax risk to um, insure. Um, normally that can go up to 8% depending on the market. Um, so I think what's also important, and this is where some of the insurance companies are much more um, astute where it comes to um, protecting legal privilege. So they are very aware of the fact that um, you don't want an opinion, um, you don't want to lose legal privilege. So the way that the communications are between the insurance, um, uh, getting the offer out there, um, identifying the tax risks, um, lots of sensitivity goes around that. So that I just need to highlight. And then the other thing where, where which is very positive is all of these insurance guys appreciate that we're not going to name the tax risk by the name, quantify it in, in an agreement. So they very... Uh, so normally how the agreements would be worded is also important is that you would say that these um, you in most of the cases, you don't even mention the tax insurance. You just say that there's an indemnity for tax. And then um, on the side, there is an insurance policy and a very light on what the actual risk is in the quantification, because obviously those things are not necessarily legally privileged. So all those sensitivities, um, I, I think is quite important when when negotiating, dealing, and obtaining tax insurance. I think uh, we are dealing with an M&A, but what I find quite interesting is the more we work with um, aspects such as uncertain tax positions, um, just interesting to note that tax insurance is also evolved a lot. It's not just limited to M&A these days. Um, it looks at restructuring, uh, balance sheet issues, for example, uncertain tax positions um, um, to get your auditors across the line. Um, so, and doing, as I mentioned, big restructures within the group, if you want to just maybe um, get tax insurance for some of those tax positions. Um, yeah, so that's that's on on um, on the tax insurance. Um, I just wanted to just overlay what you just said on the due diligence, because the identifying your risks, categorizing your risk, and then mitigating your risks um, is 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 such an important process. So I think what we normally also try and emphasize is and do, do, do due diligence is not to do it in silo mentality. Um, so we've recently seen on an, another transaction how we work very well with a with actually a, a different firm on the environmental team where the environmental um, aspects integrated a lot with our tax aspects, specifically on mineral royalties, uh, mining tax allowances, and et cetera. Um, and, and it's important that practice areas get integrated while doing due diligence so that it's more efficient. Um, learnings from different areas um, is shared across all the teams um, because, I mean, everybody, I think, appreciate that tax is a re almost touches all aspects of, of the business. So I just wanted to emphasize the integration of those practice areas while doing your due diligence. And then on the on the mitigating risk, I mean, 
Um, you've mentioned warranties and indemnity insurance, um, the actual warranties, indemnities and agreements, how we word those are so important because I think from a buyer perspective, they want specificity, but from a seller's perspective or even just managing risk as well is you don't want to do sources audit for them. So I think it's a fine line um, between buyers and sellers to get that balance right in the agreements. Um, lots of things that we recently been doing is VDPs. So if, if we've identified a risk and the parties sit around a table and they can, they, they're can happy with the quantification of the actual tax risk and people can live with that, what we do to mitigate it is go VDP so that there's no additional penalties. Um, that's also something to bear in mind. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, the disclosure of those risks in all of your documents. Be very mindful of legal privilege. Uh, be mindful of how um, due diligence reports are being circulated, shared amongst teams. Um, I think that's just something to bear in mind. Um, yeah, so I'm going to hand over to Ntabaleng now um, to, after we've now done our DD and we proceeding with the matter. What we normally also do is while we do the DD, as Gustav mentioned, I mean, we, um, as a practice, we get involved in different, sometimes we just do the structuring, sometimes we do the due diligence and the structuring. Um, so, but at most times when we get into the structuring phase, it could happen parallel with your DD team, or it could happen towards the end when the decision is made to make a final offer. So in doubling, handing over to you on the structuring and the funding. Thanks, Crystal. Um, I think once the, the DD process is done and you have now decided whether you're going to do asset sale or a share sale, um, then the funding comes into play and the structuring. And I think we'll talk about any internal restructures um, that the seller needs to do um, in just a moment. But now just starting with the buyer and how they actually fund the acquisition of either the assets or the shares. So, I mean, from a, a buyer perspective, we know that if you use um, any funding to buy assets or productive assets, then you get your interest deduction and then there's no problem. But the complexity comes in when you're either buying shares as the seller or where the seller or as, as, as the buyer or where the buyer is buying the shares via a hold co that doesn't have any other trade going on. So if it's just a shell company and you're now buying these these shares in the underlying operating company, how do you then manage your, your tax in that um, scenario? So you can either fund it by way of obviously your own funds, which is not an issue, or preference share funding from your lender or debt. So if the, the purchaser chooses to fund this by way of preference share funding, and then I issue preference shares, obviously the return that's going to be payable to the lender will be a dividend, which should be tax-free if the lender is a South African company. Now, the complexities come in with the anti-avoidance provisions of AT and ATA here, which need to be kept in mind. So I think um, everybody's quite familiar with the provisions of 8E, which looks at sort of the nature of your instruments and whether it has debt-like features. And if it does, then it can be recharacterized into income, that dividend, and suddenly it's now taxable. So now you have a tax leakage in that the holder of the preference share, so let's say your bank, will now have a taxable income instead of a tax-free, um, tax-exempt dividend. And most of the agreements with lenders will have gross-up clauses. So then that will fall again to be a cost for the buyer. And now suddenly the cost of, of your, your borrowing in inverted commas is exponentially increased. And also when we look at section 8EA, which regulate your third party backed shares. And um, there was a very nice carve out that everybody used for the qualifying purpose. So if you use the preference share funding and you had an enforcement um, obligation or right, um, and somebody other than the issuer, so somebody other than the buyer um, can now be you know, on the hook for, for the payment in the form of some kind of security, then it's a third party backed share. But if you use that preference share funding, to buy shares in an operating company, then you had a qualifying purpose and there was an exclusion from that. Now, with this new proviso that came into effect on 1 January 2024, um, that might not be the case if you dispose of the shares in the underlying operating company or otherwise 
then and you use the proceeds from that disposal for anything other than redeeming the preference shares, then suddenly you find yourself in trouble or there's also a carve out for listed shares. But we have been seeing um, a lot of clients trying to restructure their preference share arrangements because of this um, amendment. So before you just get your preference share funding, use it to buy the shares in your operating company, whether you dispose of them or not, there was no issue with that. So you could, after a year, dispose of the shares in your operating company, use the proceeds to do something else, and that instrument wasn't tainted. But now with this new proviso, suddenly you will then have a third-party back chair and the exclusions won't apply. So any dividends you pay on that preference share suddenly become taxable and you have a problem. Again, if your lender is a bank, generally the gross-up clauses will apply and suddenly the cost of that preference share funding um, can increase by, by quite a bit. That wasn't, um, you didn't forecast at right at the beginning of getting this preference share funding. So I think it's very important for when the buyer is buying the shares in the operating company to see whether this is a long-term investment that they plan to make and to manage that if they do want to dispose of, of the underlying operating company or the shares in the, the underlying operating company, that they do use the proceeds to either redeem the preference shares or have some kind of mechanism. Because I think as time goes by, so let's say we buy the shares now, people change, organizations change, somebody comes along, makes an offer for your operating company and you sell it without considering the preference share funding that you got and the, the provisions of 8EA that can now get you into quite a bit of trouble. Um, so that's on preference share funding. I think where the buyer now decides to use debt, you have to consider the profile of the buyer as well. So like I said, if you're just a pure hold co and you don't have any income, you can, 24-0 gives you a, a deduction for, so it deems your interest to be incurred in the production of your income and then therefore you get a deduction. But is that actually useful if your acquiring company is not an operating company that generates income other than exempt income on its own? So if you just have a pure holding company and all you generate is dividend um, income from, from your underlying entities, and that is obviously exempt income, you will not be able to take any deductions of your interest that you pay because you don't actually have any income against which to deduct the interest. So that, that's one thing. And then even if you do have it and you get um, the, the deemed uh, deduction in terms of 24-0, you have to consider then the interest limitation uh, provisions of 23N and where your lender is an offshore entity of 23M as well. So 23N essentially says your interest deduction is limited to 40% of your adjusted taxable income. So you have to now apply the formula. And what I've seen in practice is when parties are already at a term sheet stage and they do start doing their modeling and seeing what they can get out here, then they don't take into account the interest uh, deduction limitation provisions. So they think, okay, well, your profit should be sufficient for you to, you know, um, kind of pay off your debt after X amount of period, um, X amount of time. And this is based on modeling that doesn't take 23N into account that the deduction will be limited in that company that's now having to pay this interest. And therefore it might take a bit longer or the annual payments or monthly payments might be smaller. So in the modeling process, we also have to take that into account. Um, and I think that has to be also considered at term sheet stage already when the modeling is being done and the desirability of the transaction is being considered by both the lenders and the buyer. Um, and on that, the issue of the, from the seller's perspective, where they have to do some restructuring to get their affairs in order or to get into a desirable state for um, the buyer to actually acquire them. Um, I'll hand over to Crystal to just talk about, um, especially the issue of buybacks and what we've seen and the introduction of 43 cap A into the eighth schedule and what that means for internal restructures or restructures when they're getting ready to sell and the old um, leverage buyout um, that we all used to um, kind of use sometimes and the the excuse for the leverage buyout or well not the excuse but the commercial rationale was always that look 
the the buyer wants to buy the assets, but the seller is only willing to buy the shares. And therefore, that's why we structured our transaction as a leveraged buyout. Um, and I think with the introduction of 23N and the limitation of the interest deduction uh, provisions, then that is less popular in the market. But I think, Crystal, I'll let you just have, let's have a chat about this, the issue with the seller and their restructures. Sure, thanks, Ntabeling. Um, Yeah, so I think from the buyer's perspective, um, they have then made a decision to buy the shares um, and you've touched on um, any funding um, interjected to finance that acquisition. Um, so I think just want to, to just take full circle on that. You've mentioned the preference shares, um, the hybrid debt um, method and, and what can happen there. Um, I think in some cases, there's still um, an appetite for the traditional debt pushdown. The o and, and the question always arises is, what, we got 23N that provides that if you use Section 45 or 47 to acquire assets and you introduce funding, then the interest is limited, as you mentioned. Um, and I just want to make a side note, um, everybody... Uh, Section, uh, um, Revenue Service and National Treasury has been very busy in changing 23M, which is your offshore funding coming in. And they've now, they've they've always said to us that once they've uh, cleaned up 23M and they're comfortable with 23M, the next one to be changed aligned with 23M is 23N. So I suspect in the tax taxation laws that we're going to probably get the bills in the next month or so, is we'll see some changes to 23N. So I just want to point that out. And you make such a good point in doubling. I've seen it so many times where the models are done on the basis there is going to be an interest deduction. It doesn't take into account 23N and the limitation. What it also doesn't take into account sometimes is um, the assessed loss limitation rules that also came in. And, and those coupled together with other commercialities. I mean, in a recent transaction, the structure was done on an um, asset lease and sale back. And the interest expense was so high with the lease expenses that it was actually not a going concern in the end from a commercial and accounting perspective. So we had to rejig a transaction that was implemented just a year back. So I think all of this should be taken into con um, consideration. I often get the question when we do structuring, just get me the tax deduction. But then when you do the numbers, and that's why I like, I need to get into the numbers where you actually do the model and you say, okay, so, so how do we see this happening? What will the interest charge be? Um, and, and, and really go through that thing. So look at the interest limitation rules, look at the risks. So on debt pushdowns, I think that it's open in the market, this debate about whether 23N legitimized debt pushdowns or not. I, I, my view is always that you still have to have a commercial rationale. Why are you interjecting jet debt at that level and having to create a new go? Um, I think what raises for me as well, the question mark around this, I always consider it is, I mean, the VAT case on console, and I know it's a VAT case, and I know it's completely different factual positions, but that was a debt push down. And, and they, they didn't want to allow the VAT input because if they said, this was just another transaction. It's the same group. So I think that type of thinking of our courts and, and our argument that is by SARS, I think that maybe we'll see that. So I'm very careful in just doing a debt push down with actually considering the commercial rushing all and why we do that. Um, so and then okay, so that's just on, on some thoughts on debt push down. And I think in our next part, this is the where we will actually start going into the detail, really unpacking this commercial rationale, the implementation, it's so easy to put structuring on a, on a, on a structuring paper, but it's the really the implementation where things, re, where, where, where we need to get involved, understand the um, commercialities of the business. Um, and so, so in our next session, we'll def definitely go into this and what we see and, and share some war stories. Um, I think on, on just on funding as well, uh, you mentioned on the on the seller side, this um, there was a very popular um, subscription buyback. If you had an SA company, effectively without tax, SARS came along. They inter interposed uh, national treasury um, um, made effective paragraph forty three a. And this is old news. We've gone through this and all that. Um, 
I think there's still benefit in doing some subscriptions and buybacks. I'm working with a large transaction now where we have to do a subscription and buyback. That's how the deal is done. And it's not really for the tax, but it has this benefit still. Because if you think about it, if there has not been any other dividends, there's still the 15% um, um, upside. It's just how you structure it as well. Just be careful that you don't do a full dilution. Um, then, then properly structured it as a subscription and buyback. So again, this is some of the things that we'll unpack in the implementation. The only, the other thing that I want to mention is what we all often see, and, and this makes it very difficult to work with, is if there was a term sheet already, and you spoke about in doubling, we are now a genesis of transaction. We're excited about the transaction. There's a term sheet. Term sheet says, I'll buy the shares. And then Six months later, you get your tax advisor involved and the tax advisor says, no, 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 still do a subscription and buy back because it's beneficial for your structure. And how do you make that 360 or that 180 degree um, um, turnaround? And I mean, I don't have to tell this to you, but you're working with live where SARS is challenging these subscription and buybacks. And it's purely because there was an offer on the table signed with a share sale. So we just have to be... I think parties need to be mindful to get the tax guys involved from, from the start so that these conversations um, can happen early on on what's the best way, or even in any term sheet, have the flexibility there. I think I, I'm I'm someone that always wants to structure around flexibility. So say the structuring or acquisition asset not confirmed will be done off the DD, but this is the indicative offer. Just that flexibility, I think, is quite important from an m &I perspective. Um, just on as as well, and and then uh, on interesting. What we also have been seeing is something that's actually old news, but becoming uh, became popular again. And I see some reluctance again for, on some of the banks. Is if you've got free cash available in the group, um, especially if you have an existing group that's buying an um, an, an asset or an investment you may decide that, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my free cash that I would have used for operating expenditure or capital expenditure, and I'm going to apply that to acquire the shares and then obtain like a, um, a RCF or, or um, drawdown on funding um, or overdraft to finance my operating expenditure. So I think there's still room for that where the facts are supported. Um, I think what's just important is, um, again, the implementation of it, managing it, making sure SARS is, goes into the integrity. They want the bank accounts on that date at 12 o'clock at night. They, they actually look at that when they when they ordered these things. So I think being meticulous um, is quite important in the implementation of that type of structure. So, um, yeah, and then just to mention, I mean, structuring funding, it might not be news for most of you, but... I've found that earnouts are almost like um, the name of the game at the moment. Uh, people go in with a low ball offer that come in then with saying, okay, if if you have um if you believe in your asset, then you'll do an earnout. And now that that impacts the structuring, especially if you do something like a subscription and buyback, how do you structure that um earnout um aspect to it? And also making sure that if you uh, how you structure the earnout that it's additional consideration as opposed to some profit share or or anything like that. It just I know it's old news, but I think these things come up and you have to consist consistently think about these things. Um, and then also interesting is any escalation clauses. So if there's a delay in payments of the of or closure of the deal, then um, how do you treat that escalation in purchase price? Is it an escalation of purchase price? Is it interest? Um, I think the drafting around that can just make it very clear. Um, so I don't know if I missed anything, Tabling, or you wanted to add anything um, on, on that. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on these challenges we're seeing from SARS on the subscription and buyback transactions. And the challenges that, that while we have seen that we are assisting clients with on historical transactions, so prior to the introduction of 43 Cap A. And the fight is about specifically the tax benefit and the solar main purpose for from a GAR perspective. So was there a tax benefit? And obviously one SAR says there was a tax benefit, the onus now shifts to the taxpayer to prove that the solar main purpose of the transaction was not to obtain that tax benefit. So then, like you say, the commercial rationale in any of these transactions that are carried out will then have to be recorded 
properly at the at the first and it's probably advisable to get a gar opinion right at the first and start putting your evidence of your commercial rationale together and on the issue that you just raised about now that 43 cap a is in effect and where a majority shareholder or a, one with a qualifying interest then sells their shares or, or does the subscription and buyback there is that 15 percent upside so could SARS turn around and go well, you actually um, structured your transaction like that specifically to get that 15% upside, and now we are um, invoking the GAR provisions. So you need to, at right at the start, get your um, commercial rationale together, make sure that you have sufficient evidence, because what happens is you implement the transaction and SARS comes 10 years down the line, and the witnesses no longer work there, the people who were involved in the transaction have left, and then you don't have sufficient evidence to um, prove that the solar main purpose of the transaction was not to gain a tax benefit. So obviously when you do your structuring, you do want the best tax results, but you also have to prepare for any challenges from SARS and make sure that you've got your belts and braces that you can prove in a, in a court if that's where it ends up. Um, down the line that your commercial rationale was not um, tax solely or mainly to get a tax benefit. Yeah, like a, a very good transaction Bible. I think that's critical. And then talking, the story must flow throughout the process. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I think now we can take some questions. And doubling, I'll take one of the questions. Um, uh, which I think is a really good question on how, what are the ways that a client's legal privilege is protected on the tax opinions that are then passed on to prospective insurers. Now, what we do is we umbrella that as almost soliciting advice and part of our advisory process as legal attorneys. So what we will do is it's part of, so we will be writing to the insurer saying that, um, um, in obtaining advice and quotations on on potential ways of mitigating potential risk, can you can we enter into conversation with you and everything is protected under that umbrella? Um, and I think that's why it's so important. Um, and I think that's a a value add that that we as attorneys can definitely provide in having those conversations, putting it under our umbrella um, of legal privilege, because legal privilege is obtained through us giving advice on something potentially that may cause going to litigation. And you wouldn't be seeking mitigating uh, ways if you didn't believe that this tax risk could potentially lead to litigation. Um, and I know the insurers are also very sensitive when they then solicit tax opinions on them um, um, by themselves to a third party or a um, confirmation of valuation, they would also do go to attorneys typically to do that and that that's also covered by litigation because remember if they seek to now um ensure a tax risk they don't want an opinion out there that's not covered by legal privilege for themselves so that's normally um how they do that as well so it's 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 all around covering it with that legal privilege umbrella by the attorneys and making sure the correspondence is quite clear that this is um almost seeking further advice or soliciting input to give proper advice to the client. Um, so that's how we how we try and manage that. And remember, just from a legal privilege perspective, um, when you are now preparing for litigation, so so let's say you have now given your opinion and you've you've done all the steps that Crystal um, has set out. When you do go and then consult with your an insurer or any other third party, you do have legal privilege still because that is in the preparation for your litigation. So what if you've done the, the right thing and then you still need to go and consult with your insurer at, at a later stage or anything like that, that will still be um, legally privileged. Yes. Um, I just see a follow-up question just, um, and doubling. there's another question that I think you will take um, on the structuring side, but just on tax insurance as well. And Gustav, I mean, come in here, you've also got a lot of experience on this. Um, the question is by the participant is whether SARS, do we find that SARS is more aggressive if they know that there's tax insurance? And I think that's a yes. 
And that's why the tax insurers are very careful. They actually don't want parties to disclose that there's tax insurance until that. So for example, most of your agreements would not mention tax insurance. And they would also tell you, don't tell the authorities when you are responding to queries and all of that, that there's tax insurance. Because I think even the tax insurers are very aware of the fact that uh, this may then uh, uh, trigger SARS to not give up on a matter because they do believe that there's money behind it. Um, so that's a yes. Um, um, there's a question, Crystal, about the subscription and buyback and whether it must be governed in the same agreement or done in separate agreements. So from a GAR perspective, um, the anti-avoidance provisions say refer to an arrangement. So you look at each step of whatever arrangement you've got, and then you look at the arrangement as a whole. So whether it's governed in separate agreements, I've seen both. Um, so I've seen transactions where there's a separate subscription agreement and a separate buyback ag agreement, or it's all put into one agreement. But when the authorities now doing their audit, they look at the arrangement as a whole. So they will look at, okay, well, what um, transaction steps did you take to get to your final um, structure? So I think whether you do it together or separately from a GAR perspective anyway, it doesn't, it wouldn't help you because you have to look at both the individual steps and the arrangement as a whole. And I want to add to that in Tibbling, also from a commercial perspective, we'd likely see that both those steps will be interconditional. So the one being conditional upon the other, and you're also touching on reportable arrangements, you know, the extent of you doing a subscription and share buyback, you would disclose all of that. Um, you know, if you meet the, the threshold, because they are part of, as you say, an interrelated uh, transaction. So, yes, when it comes to reporting also, I think that's where we also seen that, you know, if you, whether you have them in separate agreements or in one agreement, you'd disclose all those transaction agreements to SARS. Um, you know, obviously it's a listed arrangement, so that's why we're referring to it. Are there any so, other questions that remain open? There's, there's a few questions. Um, I think I'm doubling, but I'm just aware of the time. I think I can take one more and then um, we can probably just close this off. And then if we missed anything, we'll go through the questions and just respond to it. Um, also, a very good question on legal privilege um, our, uh, regarding external auditors always wanting all the opinions. Um, I'm... I'm I'm very reluctant to provide opinions to external auditors as a, as a starting point. Okay. So I, I would normally push back and, and start the conversation with things like, um, we'll give you, we'll have a meeting, we'll discuss the principles, all of that, and 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 try and, and see if we can avoid that situation. Because external auditors are not protected by legal privilege. And once they have documents in their possession that was handed to them. Um, lawfully and, and provided to them, SARS can ask for that information pertaining to a taxpayer. And we've seen that. I mean, there were court cases where SARS would even ask for invoices um, and then go through the invoices to come up with how they're gonna how they're gonna do their audit. So um I'm I'm reluctant. But if we get to a point where you where there's like a deadlock with the auditors and they don't want to move on it or anything like that, I think a um a softer way of dealing with it is to have like a meeting, um, make a make it available, maybe at the at your at the attorney's office, have the attorney attend it, talk through the opinion and that. Um, so I think, and or if you can, if you can avoid sending the opinion just straight out, um, I will avoid it with any cost, and then um, try and to find an alternative way of getting your auditors uh, comfortable. Just on that, Crystal, there was the a company case, the the case about the invoices, where the the taxpayer claimed legal privilege over the invoices, and SARS actually asked them, "Did you give the invoices to your external auditors?" 
Um, so they raised that because they clearly wanted to use that as a way to get around it. And I mean, you know, usually you just wouldn't give your opinion, but invoices and things like that, you would give to your, your auditors. And in that case, the taxpayer said they couldn't recall. And so everybody let it go. So they said, we can't recall whether we've given it to our auditors. And therefore that kind of line of questioning stopped. But it would have been interesting what the court would have found um, because you know, an invoice, unlike a legal opinion, is not something generally that you would withhold from your auditors. But this is why it's so important to think about legal privilege before you make any documents, not even just legal opinions, available to third parties. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, do we have time for one? I see there's one from Nontlandla on 8EA. And uh, she just asked about the structuring we've seen put in place due to the amendments. Um, so what we've seen in the market is because some of the quantum of some of these preference shares is huge. Um, and we've seen refinances, a lot of refinances of, of the actual uh, preference shares. So you might put in a bridge until the parties actually come to an agreement on what new preference share arrangements they'll put in place. But also remember, in it depends on the uh, window that you have. So when your tax year ends, uh, of the lender ends, that's when their new tax year commences, that's when you know this will come into effect. So if, for instance, there were people whose tax years end commenced in January um, and that was just a big rush but one of the things you can do is restructure your security so we've seen a lot of consolidation of security um, the banks are not going to be willing to waive security so you'll see a lot of the moving the instrument to the holding company um, and giving uh, security by the holding company which also the banks were not too happy about because they want security in the actual operating entities or just refinancing the preference share altogether. Gabaling, I think there's also lots of conversations happening with the revenue service and hopefully we'll see something in the bill now regarding apportionment of those issues. So um, do you have any, any further news on that? No, I don't, unfortunately. I, I um, understand that some taxpayers were considering going to SARS for an actual ruling on that. Um, but I think if you, and the, the, the question is your preference shares, you know, you have your drawdowns. So some people use drawdown A to buy company uh, shares in company A, drawdown B to buy B, and therefore you have kind of, you know, you, you've put your things in silos that when you, dispose of the shares in, in company B, it's easier to just say, well, it's only that portion of the PREF funding that's that's tainted. But if you've done one big drawdown and used it to buy shares in various operating entities that you've disposed of now, then it becomes a little bit more tricky. So I suppose it depends whether you can segregate your preference share funding to do a proper apportionment or not. But I think if there is a ruling given then, you know, it will be published and we're all waited with, waiting with bated breath to see if anything comes out on that front. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful in our, in the tax bill, we'll probably see that because I know conversations have been held with SARS on apportionment and, and I, I get a sense that SARS sees the, sees the, the reasoning there. So let's hope. Um, I, th I think we're out of time in doubling. So we'll probably uh, we'll respond to any questions we've missed um, um, individually. Um, yeah. Do you want to close off? Yes. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We will be sending out a follow up invite to our part two. We will be discussing implementation and pitfalls. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.